Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to uh, the final presentation in this room for PyCon 2019. Um, on the subject of data visualization, please welcome Jake van der Plas. Well, thanks very much. Thanks for sticking around to the, the very end. Um, today, I want to talk about, uh, about thinking about data visualization. And this is sort of in, in, uh, in opposition to the question where people usually start, like, what visualization tool should I use? And I don't know if any of you were here in 2017 or in Portland in 2017. I made the mistake of deciding to do a talk about this, what visualization tools should I choose? And my, my plan was to you know, compare and contrast four or five good visualization tools in Python. But as I started digging, it turns out there's a lot of ways to visualize data in Python. And um, yeah, so, so I don't think this is a good place to start right now because they're, I, I saw someone putting their camera up. I'll let you take another picture of this. Um, yeah, so the, I don't think this is a good place to start because there's too much confusion and there's too many different things. And really what it boils down to is the Python community has so, such a, a wide diversity of uh, use cases and applications that you need a lot of different tools to accomplish the, the different types of visualization that people are doing. So I, I don't want to start with that question, what visualization tool I, I should use. I want to start with this, how should I think about data visualization? Like, what is data visualization? And then we can build up from there, build up the concepts, and start thinking about um, how we can make effective visualizations, no matter which of those uh, million plotting packages you decide to use. So, um, so what is visualization? You know, if you, if you take a data set like this, uh, what visualization does is it tries to take this representation of the data set, kind of a tabular form, and put it in, in a form that makes it more intuitive. So that at first glance, you can, you can find the relationships between the data. Um, do, does anyone recognize this data set? There's, there's a few, uh, few hands. Um, how about if, um, so, so this, is a, this is a data set where there are, if you take common uh, statistical summary statistics, like the mean, standard deviation, correlation, things like that, all these four data sets are the same. But if you visualize them, you start to see that there's um, some very different properties in the data set. So um, visualization is important because um, it, it helps us see what's in our data. It helps us get an intuitive feel for what's in these tables of numbers. Um, and, and what's going on here when we, when we visualize data is we're, we're essentially encoding the, the values in the data set into certain visual representations. So what are these here? In, in this case, the way we've encoded this data set is we've put the x value and the x position on each plot, the y value and the y position. We've drawn a little circle. And then we've split up the data by, we've, we've faceted the data into four different facets or four different panels to uh, get a feel for what each individual data set is. So this is, this is an encoding. This is something, a way we've transformed the data from numbers into individual properties. Um, so we could think, like, what, what other encodings might we use? We use the... Um, X value, Y value, and the facet here to look at this. But we could do something different, right? We could use, instead of the facet, we could encode the different data sets by color. Um, and then we, we get the advantage of having everything on the same panel where it's easier to uh, maybe compare, but this is, this is sort of a muddled plot, right? So maybe, maybe color is not the best encoding for the data set. What if we do shape, right? Well, you see a lot of these kinds of encodings where people draw different classes of data with different shapes. It can be effective and sometimes not effective. I would, I would argue in this case it's not very effective. It's hard to pull out what's going on there. You know, you could do something like size. That, that, that might help here. And the, these are all different visual features you can use to encode the same information. And maybe we can do uh, the shape, size, and color all together. And this is starting to get a, a little, you know, a little bit crazy, but it, but it it does help you maybe distinguish what's going on in these data sets. But, um, you know, for, for argument's sake, I would, I would say that this is not a very effective visualization, right? There's something about this visualization that's just not quite as appealing and not quite as intuitive about than, uh, compared to the four-panel plot. So we'll get into that later. We can start thinking about what drives that, that intuition in visualizations. So here's one that's, you know, we, we just throw everything at it. We encode the data set by, by facet, by shape, by size, by color, 
It's a little bit crazy, but it, um, you know, it helps us see what's going on. So, th so this is good to think about. Like we can, we can encode all these different properties in different ways. Um, but there's one, there's one property in this data set that we're missing so far. Has anyone, does anyone see what that might be? What, what, does, what does this visualization of the data set completely ignore? I hear some, I hear some mumblings. Um, the, the, here, here's the, the row number. There's no, there's no information here that tells you the order of the points as they appear in the table, right? So we could, we could add some more information to that. We could say maybe the index or the row number of the data is encoded in the color in this four panel plot. And that's sort of hard to see. It's, you know, the, maybe if you like, if you, if you looked with a magnifying glass and, and kind of like categorized things, you could maybe see which point is, is which. So maybe for the order, we can do something like adding a line. Um, and we see that, the, that here in this data set, the order doesn't, doesn't really mean anything, right? So, but that information was there, and that, that information was completely lost in the previous panels that we did. So, um, you know, we, we could start thinking about better ways to represent the order in the data. Like here, here's all these four values in the data set encoded in a completely different way. We have index on the y-axis, the, the, so the order of the points. We have the, the data set on the x-axis, and then we use color and size to show the relationships between the values. Now, this doesn't really work. You can't really, you can't see, color and size doesn't give you that intuitive view of the relationship between the data points, right? But we could play this game, we could do all sorts of things. We could split the data up into the four data sets and use, uh, use the size of the points. Or we, we could use the color of the points. We could, we could decide that instead of using a circle mark, we might use a, a rectangle patch and create kind of a heat map of the data. Um, we, we could use a bar chart in each of those panels that shows the, shows the, the scale of the data split up by these various factors. So this is, essentially, this is a data set with four different dimensions of information. And we can choose all these different ways to encode um, the information in that data. Some of them are more intuitive than others. Some of them let us see the relationships better than others. And some of them are just really, really bad. <laughs> Um, this is w one that I really like. I, I, I played around for a while, and um, this one, the, the row of the data, the, the order isn't encoded, but kind of the grouping of, of the index is encoded. And we use a, a slope between two different points to show the relationships between the points in each table. And this actually gives you, it, it's not kind of, it, maybe not as intuitive as a, as a normal familiar scatter plot, but this gives you a a good idea of uh, what some of the, the weird points in the data set are. So anyway, the point is um, all these different representations that I've run through are encodings of the exact same data. They contain all the exact same information. Um, but there's something in here that we're, we're starting to get an intuition for that makes, makes some of these effective and some of these ineffective. So as we're thinking about how to visualize data, it would be nice to kind of put our finger on what makes a visualization effective? Um, you know, what is it about these, uh, these faceted bar charts that, that end up not being very useful? So um, just as a, as a quick summary of, of what I've been talking about uh, over the course of looking at all these visualizations, we have, um, we've set up something where, where data properties are encoded in some sort of visual representation. Um, we, have, we have the data represented by some mark that might be a line, a point, a bar, a patch on a heat map. And um, we have scales that map these encodings onto the values that go under, underneath. The scales might be the uh, numbers on the x-axis or the, um, the labels in the legend or the color bar. Right, and so what this suggests is that we can start talking about visualization in terms of uh, grammar. Um, and this, this goes back, a lot of people have been thinking about this for, for decades and decades. And, the, and one of the more famous books that, that talks about visualization as a grammar is this book by Wilkerson, Wilkinson, um, The Grammar of Graphics. And, and basically he lays out that when you, when you want to create a, a chart, the grammar you have is you start with the data, you have some sort of transformation of the data, you have these marks that we talked about, whether it's a point or a line or a bar, 
or it might be multiple points of different shapes. Um, we have the encoding, which could be X position, Y position, color, shape, size. And then we have the scale, which are the ways that we um, indicate to the reader what the encoding means. So we have here, for example, we have um, labels on the x-axis and y-axis, and we have a legend that maps the shape and the color to uh, values of interest. So, um, so the question is, what, what, when we're looking at two different representations of a data set like this, what visual encoding is going to be most effective? and what mark is going to be most effective, and what scale is going to be most effective for my data. And these are the kind of things that people in, in the visualization community have been researching for years. And an, an example is um, this Jacques Burton uh, put, put out this semiology of graphics, which basically tried to lay out the theory of which encodings, which marks are going to be most effective for a given data set. And it's in French, so uh, we'll, we'll shift to French now for the rest of the talk. <laughs> uh, no, I'm gonna, uh, I, I have these on in uh, the translations here. So he, he basically laid out what we, what from the top to the bottom, what the most effective encodings are in terms of, of human perception. And you know, at the top we have things like 2D position. Um, and we can see that 2D position is, uh, is useful for, for knowing the order of data and also the quantity of the data. We can, we can eyeball that and figure out you know, what the values are roughly as, as well as the, the order of the values. Um, size is similar. We can, size gives us a sense of order and a sense of quantity. Um, color value can also be, give, give us a sense of order and a sense of quantity. We go from lightest to darkest. As we, as we start going down the scale, though, we get to encodings that are less useful for quantity or for order, but can be useful for, for categories. So, for example, the, the color hue, the red, blue, green, yellow, this doesn't give you any sense of order. So you wouldn't want to, you, you wouldn't want to apply this to a uh, quantitative axis. You couldn't look and say red is less than green and green is greater than blue. But it does give you a good sense of category. And, and similar for shape. Um, it gives you a sense of category, but not order. Right, so a, as you start thinking about this, you can, you can lay out this chart. And um, essentially here, the, if, you, if you think of three types of data, nominal data, which is sort of categorical, stuff that's not ordered at all. Um, ordinal data, which is uh, discrete ordered categories. And then quantitative data, which are, which are continuous quantities. Um, they're encoded better or worse by um, each of these possible encodings. So position, for example, is, is very good for nominal, ordinal, and quantitative data. It gives us a sense of, of data identity, it gives us a sense of scale, and a sense of order. Whereas if you go down to things like color value, you can get um, nominal and, and, and ordinal quantities, the, the order of the data, but not necessarily as much the, the actual quantity of, of, that the data is representing. Right, so as you start to think about this, there, there's a few practical takeaways um, when you're developing a visualization. One is not all encodings are created equally. So if we look at this, the, we sort of identified that this was a bad visualization earlier. Uh, I think the reason that this is a bad visualization is because it's, um, encoding, it's encoding things that it's not using the most optimal encoding for a property in the data that's very important. Like here, we, we're distinguishing between four different data sets. So we, we probably want to use the most, uh, most intuitive and most uh, easily perceptible encoding to do that. And um, s color and shape and size are not the most easily immediately perceptible encodings for people looking at a chart. Whereas position is, you know, if we split these out positionally, we can immediately look at it and see that these are four different categories without having to think deeply about the meanings of the symbols. Right, so, so one takeaway is we should prefer position encodings whenever possible. Um, because they, they're something that we can just, at a glance, understand. So an example of this in the real world, here's some data from the census, where we have the, the distribution of age versus population over the course of every decade going back to uh, 1850. And this 
is not a very intuitive chart. All the information is there, but it's, it's really difficult to see what's going on, right? You can't, it's not easy to see the difference between two, the year 2000 and the year 1990 in this plot. So what can we do? We can, instead of encoding this important information in color, we can encode, encode this important information in position. We facet the data, and this, this is something that's uh, known in the visualization community as small multiples. Um, Making, making lots of different views of the data that are um, changed slightly from panel to panel. Um, and making use of these kinds of small multiples can be a way to, to really quickly create effective visualizations because you're encoding these important properties in, um, in an encoding that's easy to perceive, the position. And I, I love this, uh, this visualization, by the way, because it, um, you, you can sort of see uh, where are we, in 1950, here's the, the baby boomer bump and you can kind of follow them as they get older and there's the bump and then here's the baby boomers kids in 2000 that are starting to, starting to, to populate and it. And it sort of like marches along to the right and then and tapers off at later years. Um, so the, the, the second takeaway that I wanna show, tell you is that the, the best color scale is going to depend on data type. So we thought about, um, we, we thought about using colors as encodings, and, and it really, the, the effectiveness of a color encoding is gonna change depending on what you're looking at. So um, this is an example of a, of a not very good encoding. Right? This is uh, using the color hue, something that's very well suited to nominal data, to categorical data, but this is using a color hue to try to encode quantitative information. And, um, it, the reason it's not very good is because it, it can often um, call your attention to the wrong aspects of the data set. Like this, in this rainbow color map, the yellow really stands out to you just because of the way that your eyes work. And yellow is not, it's not at the extremes. It's not high unemployment rate or low unemployment rate. It's somewhere in the middle. And so, so by kind of emphasizing the yellow on first glance, we're not really conveying the right information in this plot. So a, a better thing, color scale to use for this sort of quantitative data is a, is a per perceptually uniform one like color value. So, our, so uh, effectively, uh, we're looking at the, um, the transparency of the color as well as, a, as a, a uniform change from yellow to blue. And this shows you a little bit more what's going on with this, this unemployment in each county. We see that there's, there are patches of high unemployment and across the Midwest it's relatively low unemployment and it gives you a, a better intuitive sense of what's happening in the data. Another type of color map that you should keep in mind is if you're, if you're doing something that has, um, uh, that has a, a symmetric distribution around a midpoint like for example here, this is the unemployment with the average subtracted, where average unemployment across the US is in white, and um, high un higher unemployment is in blue, and lower unemployment is in red. This kind of diverging color map lets you, um, lets you see two, two uh, extreme quantities at once in a very intuitive way. So using these kinds of, uh, using your using color as effectively as possible can, can help you create really nice visualizations. And the last thing I wanna say is, as a general principle is um, it, can be, it can be really useful to use a visualization API that has these kinds of grammatical approaches built in. Because then you need to spend less time thinking about it and making sure you're making good choices. And instead you can spend a lot of time with your, uh, with your package that you're using making the right choices for you. So the, the way I like to think about it is we, we want to have a visualization tool where the way we think about visualization in terms of these encodings and grammar is mapped onto the way we code in visualization and that that's mapped onto the way the visualizations are presented on the screen. And one of the things I've found over the years is that when you have a good set of APIs that um, maps on to how you should think about things, it helps you think about things better. It's sort of this, uh, this positive feedback loop of making you um, more, more aware of exactly how you should be approaching your problems. So 
There, there are a number of interesting grammar-based plotting packages that are out there. Probably the best known is ggplot2 in the R world. And that's, that's an API that's built directly on this Grammar of Graphics book that I mentioned earlier. So in, in the R world, you'll find that people, uh, people love this and you know, swear by it and would never use Python because ggplot2 is not available. It's, it's an incredibly powerful tool. Uh, in the Python world, um, there's an interesting package called plot9, which um, essentially its goal is to take the ggplot2 API and bring it to Python, and it uses matplotlib as a backend. Matplotlib is this, uh, this visualization tool that's been um, used over the last 20 years and is, is very mature. Um, there are other approaches. Uh, Vega Lite is a, is a grammar that's implemented in JavaScript and, um, and JSON that lets you specify visualizations in a, in a grammar-based approach. And Altair is a package that I've been working on in the Python world that, um, uh, that gives you a Python API for this Vega Lite grammar. And um, because I'm the one speaking, I'm going to focus on Altair. <laughs> so a, a real quick look at Altair. Um, I know I told you I was not going to recommend a tool, but you should really use Altair. Uh, it's, a, it's a good package. Um, so the idea with Altair is that if you, if you take data that's in a tidy format, um, it's kind of with rows being, um, being uh, observations and columns being uh, categories of those observations, then you can, you can create an Altair plot by kind of directly specifying this sort of grammar that we were talking about before. And um, so just real quick here, we're specifying that we want the mark to be a point. We want the, the X encoding to go to the pedal length, the Y to the sepal width, and the color to the species. And it pops out right there. You, the, the grammar maps directly onto the plot. So uh, the, the another nice thing about Altair is because the visualization is implemented in JavaScript, it's, um, you can get um, interactive visualization very trivially by, by adding an interactive tag. And um, yeah, just to, to emphasize, this, this whole grammar of visualization is built right into the API. We specify the data in the chart, we specify the marks, we specify what encodings we want to, there to be. Um, and then we, we end up with a, with a very flexible way to create charts. So if we want to add a, a column, for example, we just say that we want the column to be species, and it passes it. If we want a, a tooltip encoding where you hover over the point and it tells you the values in that point, you can specify that exactly. Um, and the power of this sort of grammatical approach means that you're not trying to remember whether you're going to make a tick plot or a bar plot. The, the choice of the mark and the choice of the encoding specify exactly what it is. You're not creating categories of plots. You're, you're creating a, a, a grammatical specification of what you want to be on the screen. So here's, here's a tick plot where we show all the, the petal widths for each species. Um, if we want to change this to a bar plot showing the mean, all, all we have to do is change the mark there from tick to bar and change the encoding of the X from the pedal width to the mean of the pedal width. So it's, it's not about remembering what the API for a bar plot is versus the API for a tick plot. It's about using the same unified grammar to specify those things. Um, now, so the other thing that's built into Altair, which is really nice, is this, this idea of using the right color maps for the right data. So if you specify a, um, a quantitative value for your color, it'll choose a quantitative uh, color map. And we can, we can, if we want to be explicit about what sort of categories of data we have, this little colon Q for colon quantitative tells us that it's a quantitative value. If we change, for example, to an ordered value, we get the same color map, uh, but we get automatically get a legend that tells you um, what the categories are, rather than uh, a continuous error bar with the, or a continuous color bar with the categories identified, and if we change to a, a categorical type with no no order, like the uh, the origin, it automatically shifts the color map to something that's appropriate for categorical data. So it, it's nice because you you don't have to think about color maps anymore. Just as long as your data type is specified correctly, the the color map will be correct. And um, so the, the other cool thing about Altair is, is on top of this grammar of visualization, there's, this, uh, there's a grammar of interaction that was added about a year ago before, before last year's PyCon. And um, 
What the grammar of interaction does is it allows you to specify types of selections that you can add to the plot. So here I've added a, uh, an interval selection to the plot. It doesn't do anything yet. You can, you can click and drag it around. But what we need to do is, is attach this interval selection to some of the encodings. Um, so instead of saying the color is, going to, is the origin, we can say the color is conditioned on the selection. And if it's inside, it'll be the origin. If it's outside, it'll be gray. So all of a sudden, with a few lines of code, we can, we, we can specify in a grammatical, grammatic, grammar of visualization sense, uh, a really kind of complex interaction. You know, has anyone ever tried to make something like this in D3? It's, uh, yeah. <laughs> it can be, it can, it's a lot more than 12 lines of code. Um, so, and, and we can start tying things together. So if I take this, this chart and I store it in a variable called chart, and then I um, tie it together with, uh, with another chart, with, with this OR bar that puts charts next to each other, then, then we have a, a, a cross-linked uh, dynamic brush that highlights points um, in, in each panel, and it knows how to, how to propagate those selections from panel to panel. And we can even do things like create a histogram where the, the X value is the count, uh, the Y value is the origin, so we get the number of the number of cars for, for each country, and then um, attach that to the data set, add this, transform it by filtering by the selection, and then we get a dynamic histogram of what's inside our selection. So the, this kind of grammatical approach to specifying visualizations can, can lead to a, a hugely powerful way of, of building up um, intuitive visualizations of data. And so I'd, I'd encourage you to check out Altair. Um, it, it, the website is there, and there are a bunch of examples on there. We just did a big release of the package about a week ago um, of the 3.0 version that it adds a number of new features. Um, so anyway, sorry for, for telling you about a package, even though I promised you I wouldn't. But it's the thing that I've been working on a lot lately, and, and it's, it's been a lot of fun. So the, the summary, the takeaway is, um, if, you wanna, if you're doing visualization, what, what you're trying to do is encode your data into visual properties. And not all of those properties are equal. So, for example, the, uh, the position is, is probably the best and most intuitive way to encode data. So use position as much as possible before you start going into shape and color hue and things like that. Um, th think about the colors, the, uh, the marks and the encodings and the scales you use. One nice thing about this grammatical approach is that it, it ca categorizes things for you so it's easy to think about the possibilities that are out there rather than being tied to the API of some imperative visualization library that, that um, keeps you from, from exploring. Um, the other thing is explore small multiples. You know, do, do lots of di little visualizations of your data set because it can give um, intuition into what's going on. And I'd encourage you to choose a, a grammar-based approach to data exploration. Um, if you're into R, try ggplot2. It's, a, it's an incredible tool. If you're in Python, try plot9 or try Altair. Um, if, you, if you like JavaScript, um, using Vega and Vega Lite directly is a, is a good option. Particularly in, uh, there's these observable notebooks in the JavaScript world that, uh, that allow you to do that very quickly. So um, explore those tools and um, see how effective you can be at the visualizations you're doing. So thanks very much. Thank you again, Jake. Um, I think we may have time for one question, if uh, anyone has a question. There are microphones in the aisle. One question over here. Hey, great presentation. I guess uh, if there was one feature you really wish you had and that isn't in existence in those packages, like what, what would it be? What's on your... Which yeah, so the, the one, uh, one feature that I really wish was there is at this point, there's kind of in, in this whole world, there's a trade off between interaction and size of data that can be handled. So the, the tools that create static plots are good at handling large data sets. The tools that create interactive plots are not good at handling large data sets, um, particularly in this, uh, in this sort of declarative grammar-based world. So I want a tool that has both of those together, that can, that can do millions of points with a grammar-based specification um, in an interactive manner. And if you, if you look at my talk from two years ago, I talk about some tools in the Python world that are out there that, that 
some of those boxes, but um, I, I don't think the, uh, the killer app is out there just yet. Thank you again, Jake. Yeah.